God is working and he's overcoming and that there were so many kings in the Bible that were bad men. There were so many kings that their father's father started out right and then they down the road didn't, get, didn't do things right. But yet God always sends someone. Could you be the someone? Does God want to use you in a new way? Does God want to send you down a new path? Does God want to do something new inside of us and change our thinking into what his thinking is? Girls, we're switching over today. Will you go with me there? We're going kingdom. We're not going world. We're going kingdom. And we're switching over. I refuse to entertain the world any longer. That was my last day yesterday. I was done. I was good. Good. And I will be praying for all of the leaders to get saved. That's what I will be doing. And I will ask the Lord to do that because that's all I can do. Because to me, the people in this world are hurting. I was on a phone call with somebody this week, and they're contemplating suicide. I was on a phone call with somebody else, just lost their spouse after 58 years. I was on another phone call, and there's such broken, broken people out there hurting and scared and lost and don't know what. But I'm here to say to you, church of the living God, you are his daughter of the most high God, and he has called you to be a overcomer. That this should not take you out, this should not tear you down, take your life out, and cause you to have no value. But this, the word of God, the anchor in these times, will help you and cause you to be an overcomer in the hardest places, in the deepest, darkest moments. When you feel that there's no one there, I'm here to tell you you're not alone. You're not alone. All of us feel overwhelmed. All of us feel defeated. All of us feel beaten up and torn down. Listen, but it does not matter because we're here. I'm going to share two incredible men and men of God that went before us that we can learn from. I want to talk about them. One is Daniel in the lion's den. We've been told, Pastor Dan and I, how dare you guys open your church? How dare you? Now, listen, these aren't unbelievers. These are Christians saying this stuff to us. And say, how dare you? I can't believe you guys are going against the government. I want you to be clear. Let me be clear. We didn't at first. We were, we were in it with you. We were like, okay, this is serious. Like, we got we to, gotta, like, lock down. But after four weeks and going through Easter with no church, we're not okay with that. And in those four weeks, we heard the voice of God loud and clear. It was like an audible voice for Dan and I. Don't you ever close the doors to my church again. I was like, ooh, fear God. I Okay, yes, sir. You know, like, I'm not going against God. Uh, you can hate me for it. You can call me whatever you want. I don't really care. You can tell me I'm evil. I don't really care what you think. But what I do care is what he thinks. And so when I heard the voice of God, I was like, we got to do it. And then talk to Dan. Dan's like, oh, yeah, same thing, same thing. So we knew where we were going. And then they tell us that we can't sing. Then they tell us we got to close our doors again. Then, they, you know, it's just like one thing after another. There's no rhyme or reason to anything. They're just trying to shut the church of God down. There's principalities behind all of this, guys. This is, this is demonic activity. It is evil. It's dividing and devouring each other. You saw everything that's been going on. Does any of this look like God to you? No. But here was Daniel in the same exact situation. Here's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the same exact situation. Here's a king. Let's talk about Daniel. He actually had favor with this king because this king was bringing in witchcraft, soothsayers, all these people into his courts because God wrote on the wall and he was scared and nobody could interpret it except for Daniel. Why? Because he had the Holy Spirit. He could hear and download what God told him to repeat. And he was considered greater than all of the magicians and soothsayers and the evil that is going around. You see, God's powerful than any demonic principality that's coming after us, guys. Any demonic. And here's Daniel. And Daniel had favor in that king's eyes. And so he gave him position. He gave him a lot of authority along with others. Well, Daniel's authority and Daniel's wisdom was beyond what these other men could even get close to. So they became jealous and they were frustrated. Have you ever been the Christian on the scene and they're like mad at you and they're shady with you on, on work? I've been, I've worked like 15 jobs and I'm telling you this has happened to me several times. People just hate you because they hate you. And it's because you're, you're prospering, because there's favor on you, because there, something is different about your work, work ethic. And I believe that was what Daniel had. He had a work ethic that was special and unique and holy. 
And so they wanted to take him down, and they knew the only thing, they tried finding all the different ways they could take Daniel down. But there was never one because he was trustworthy, because he never spoke a lie out of his mouth. Wow, what a, what a concept, right? And he was a good man, a godly man, a holy man. So they couldn't find anything wrong with him. And so what they decided to do was they were like, let's stop him from worshiping his God. So they, they brought up this declaration. They brought it to the king. And they made a new law that, king, if anybody prays to anyone else but you for 30 days, then they'll be thrown into the den of lions. And the king, probably being a narcissist, was like, okay, yeah good idea. And so what happens? Daniel reads the new law. He was faced with a choice. He was faced with a choice. Guys, you're faced with a choice right now in our society. You're faced with a choice. Do things God's way or do it your way. And Daniel was faced with a choice. And he said, I I will not back down from what God told me to do. I will not stop praying to my God. I will not And he went back to his room and he opened his windows and he prayed three times that day. And in the middle of his prayer time, they they knew he would be praying. And so they came and they caught him in the act. And the king was so troubled by it because he loved Daniel. But he knew he had to stick to what he had made a law. And he let Daniel go into the lion's den. And the king went back and fasted and prayed because he was so troubled that Daniel would be in with the lion's den. And we're going to pick up the story. I wanted to read it to you. So go with me. Go with me. Daniel 6. I feel like we're in the lion's den, guys. I feel like the Christians are about to see some persecution in America. I feel like you're going to be faced, and I, I, I hate the word feel. I just know by the Spirit, this is a warning to us, church, that it's time for us to wake up. We're really comfortable and we're cozy, but we're being faced with some real decisions right now. And Daniel made his decision. In verse 10, it says that he went and he leaned. He knew the law was signed and he knelt down as usual in his upstairs bedroom. So he was making a statement, I will not. I'm going to pray even though they tell me not to. Then it says, verse 20, 20, let's see, where should we go? Okay, verse 19. Very early in the morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you serve faithful and able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, long live the king. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions that they would not hurt me for I have been found innocent in his sight. Ooh, I love that. And I have not wronged you, talking to the king, your majesty. The king was overjoyed, and he ordered Daniel to be lifted up out of the den. The king gave orders to arrest the men who maliciously accused Daniel. He had thrown thrown them into the lion's den along with their wives and their children. The lions leaped on them and tore them to pieces even before they hit the floor of the den. God doesn't play games. Verse 25. Then King Darius sent a message to the people of every race, every nation, and every language peace and prosperity to you. I declare that everyone throughout the kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel, for he is a living God. He will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his rule will never end. He rescues, and he saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the earth and on heaven, and he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius, the king of Syria. Listen to me. One man faced with, am I going to find out what God wants from me? Am I going to do what God says or am I going to do what man says? What are we going to do, church? Are we going to do what God says or are we going to do what man says? Second one, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men had a little different version of what Daniel had. Daniel had favor with the king. The king did not like these men. Because he wanted to be worshipped. And because he made a new law that everyone come and worship my golden idol that I made. We aren't seeing golden idols right now. But I'm here to tell you, when they shut the churches of the living God down, 
And they began to tell us, you don't even know this, but they were trying to make a law last year that we can't use the Bible because it goes against homosexuality. Come on, guys. There's some shady stuff underground going on against the churches of God. And when you say, worship this golden idol, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no way. We're not bowing before anything but God. Nothing but God. And so the king drew them to himself and he said, if you do not worship me, then I am going to throw you into the fiery furnace and I'm going to make it seven times hotter. And you know what? A lot of us would go, ooh, okay, okay, no, I'm good, I'm good. I'm going to just not make any more waves. I'm scared for my life. I wonder how many Christians would really be, all right, go ahead and throw me in the furnace then. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're going to face our own persecution, church. The times of easy peasy Christianity are over. Nebuchadnezzar hated them. And I'll tell you right now, the government hates the church right now. And there is someone in the White House at least contending for us and contending for Jerusalem and Israel. That I do need to point out to you because you may not see it that way, but that's what's happening. And in this, this man hated the church, hated what represented God. But look how God delivers them from that. I believe God's going to deliver us as well. You ready? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High, come out, come out of here. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. And then the high officers and the governors and the advisors crowded around them. And they saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their hair head was singed. Not their clothing was scorched. Not even the smell of smoke. Wow. Then the Nebuchadnezzar said, praise the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He has sent his angel to rescue the servants whom trusted in him. They defiled the king's command, and they were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own God. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race and their nation and their language, speak the word against God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God, they will be torn limb to limb and their houses will be turned into a heap of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. How we forget. Because we're so far away from those stories. We've so come so far. But yet, I'm called, you're called to be some overcomers like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, like Daniel in the lion's den. You're called to be an overcomer. You're called to raise your children to serve God and to be a fear and afraid of what God can do to him, not man. We're so foolish that we're afraid of what man can do to us. When God can send our souls to hell, we should be more afraid of God than we are of man. Let's get our thinking on straight, girls. I know Pastor Jess hasn't been very loving today. I'm so sorry. But this is burning inside of me. And I'm watching our world fall apart, beat each other up, lies being spewed, and everybody going, oh, amen, so good. What? Church, are you listening to what they're saying? It doesn't say anything like God says. Why are we listening to that? We are the church of the living God. The world is peripheral to us. We are not peripheral to the world. Let's get ourselves back in the right positions that we need to stand in here. And let's take some authority and let's do and take back our land. How do we become overcomers? How do we take back our land? How do we take back our thoughts? How do we take back our lives and our hearts because they've gone astray from the things of God? I have three things for you that we can learn from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from Daniel. You ready today? Because I'm not playing games apparently. And I love you too much. I will be accountable double portion one day in front of God if I don't tell you the truth. I have this sword 
because your stance is no longer this, girls. That's not your stance anymore. Your stance is this. Your stance is pick up your sword. Take your stand because it's time to fight. It's time swords out, shields up, armor on. It's time for you to get prayed up. It's time for you to be ready for what's coming. He's coming after your kids. He's coming after your husband. He's coming after your household. He's coming after your thoughts. He's coming after your life. He's coming after you. And you can lay down and you can coward or you can be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel and stand your ground and trust God is going to come through for you. Because I'm here to tell you today, God is not raising any wimps. He has ordained us. He has equipped us. He has given us our spiritual gifts so that we can overcome the devourer as I have taught you. And it is time for us to step in because we are on mission. Here we go, number one. How can I overcome some impossible places in my life? Impossible places. You look at things and you go, it's impossible. I don't know how to do this. Guess what? You don't have to know how to do it. God's got it. And he's going to teach us how to do this. So, swords out, shields up, ready to go, number one. We cannot compromise our walk with the Lord. Number one. We cannot compromise our walk with the Lord. What does that look like? That means I can't agree with things that God doesn't agree on. Because then I'm now separated from what God thinks about something. And then I'm in my own thoughts and he, he thinks differently and I'm not lined up with God. So I can't compromise that. When God asks me to do something, I've got to be ready to go there and do it. I cannot compromise. Now, when you compromise something, you will lose it. I was the girl that always tried to keep the boyfriend that was, like, shady and cheated on her, you know. And then when he would come back, I'd be like, oh, I don't even like myself enough, but okay, come on back, you know. I was the wimpy girl, the girl that felt like that was my value, felt like that's all I deserved. And I would always fall back into that. You know what that was? Compromise. Compromise to what it was that God had for me in my life. It was compromise to who God really asked me to be. And until I stepped into Christ, until I learned who I was and what my identity was, then I could no longer compromise. So when I was then saved, radically full of Jesus, in love with the Lord, and I couldn't get more of him enough, fast enough, in one day I was like, drink it in, drink it in. I still listen to like 20 messages a day and only praise and worship because I had to get this sin nature out of me and I had to put the God nature in me. We're all human, guys. We all screw up. All of us. Not one of us is perfect. But God is. And when I began to let my flesh speak to me and compromise with me, louder than what God is asking of me, I've got a problem. I have a problem. And guess what? You do too. Because God is asking us to not compromise what it is he's giving us. You see, we see these two stories, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These were two stories of men that did not compromise. I keep thinking of Esther and Mary and Elizabeth. These were women that did not compromise what they knew their mission was. Who are you? Amanda, Alice, Michelle, Ka Kathy, you guys are not to compromise. Because you're called and you're bought with a price. Listen to this. You're anointed, you're ordained, and you're called and you're loved. And you're on mission. You can't walk away from this. The compromise isn't worth it, guys. It'll de be your demise. Your compromise will be your demise. It will. See, Christ loves you so much that he knows that compromise starts here. Right here. You see this right here? It's our thoughts. And especially in quarantine. Have your thoughts gone a little crazy? Like, can I, you want me to open up and tell you, like, what I think? Confession 101. Okay, so, like, I don't have any friends, and I don't really know if anybody really likes me, and da 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 and then I think these th things. Okay, so do you think these things? Because you haven't seen your friends in, like, forever, and they are doing their thing and doing whatever, right? Or maybe you think, oh, I'm just so ugly. I just this. I just that. Listen, those are compromises. God never said that you don't have any friends. What does he say? He says, 
that he is the ultimate friend. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Don't neglect that friendship. Number two, maybe you're saying, I hate myself. I hate myself. I don't like who I am. I've gained too much weight. I'm beating myself up. It would be better for others if I'm not here on this earth. Lies. Compromise. Lies. Compromise. Because the world will tell you and defeat you and take you down to a level where there's not clear thinking going on. And if you're not in this every single day, every single moment of every single hour, there's a waiting. There's an enemy and he's waiting like, okay. She's not writing our word today. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get in there, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lie. I'm going to tell her how horrible she is. I'm going to tell her what a horrible wife she is. I'm going to tell her what a crappy mom she's been, and how look at how these kids turned out. That's all her fault. I'm going to tell her. I'm going to tell her that she was a horrible wife. I'm going to tell her that she's a bad employee. I'm going to tell her that her sin is still an issue, even though she thinks she was forgiven. I'm going to tell her anyways. And all of a sudden, we start, hmm, Oh, why did that thought come back? Why am, why am I feeling this way? Why am I compromising? Well, maybe that's true. and Maybe that's right. And maybe, no. I'm here to say to you, no. No. You do not compromise with Satan. You do not negotiate with the devil. Your thoughts are your thoughts given to you by heaven. And those thoughts are not your thoughts. Those are demonic Arrows, those are lions coming to seek whom he may devour. Understand your opponent, girls. Understand your compromise cannot be your demise. So many times we get caught up in our feelings. We're women. We're very emotionally driven. It's okay, right? Sometimes. Sometimes. Our feelings our emotions, and those are gauges to what's going on on the inside. But they're not fact of the outcome of what's going on on the inside. God is the final say in where you land at the end of your life. God is the final say on your destiny. God is the final say on your thoughts and on your heart matters. God is the final say over your marriage and over your children and over your families and your grandbabies and your marriages and those things which the enemy is trying to rip from us right now. Swords out, girls. Shields up. This is not a joke. This is serious battle time. And the church has been playing patty cake way too long. I only go to church on Sunday mornings when it's convenient for me. You know, your little butt should be in church every time the doors are open because Satan is coming after you and your family, and you can't afford to get enough of Jesus. You better get all of God you can get because I'm here to tell you, don't give him any room to take you out because he's looking whom he can take out. I've watched it. I've watched God. I've watched Satan in this season rip people from church. Rip them right out of church. They were goats. They were led astray. 2 Corinthians 10. Sorry, I'm feisty today. 2 Corinthians, I'm just going to go off these notes. 2 Corinthians 5, 6. The world is unprincipled. It's a dog-eat-dog world. I talked about it in the beginning of the service. It was was mean. Everybody was so mean to each other. The world doesn't fight fair. But we don't live or fight our battles that way, do we? Never uh, Never have and never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation. This is not a word of God that will manipulate you. It will not lie to you. It will not give you false anything. This is the only truth. He is the way and the truth and the life. These tools will not manipulate you, but they are for demolishing the entire massively corrupt culture. What? You're telling me that I carry some tools to wipe out this nasty world we're living in? Yep. So why are we sitting down and biting and devouring and jumping on team red, team blue? Why are we sitting down, biting and devouring each other over the color of our skin when we're kingdom? Why are we biting and devouring each other when we are bought with a price, when we have been set apart, when we have been engrafted into the kingdom of God as sons and daughters? Why? 
I'm posing that question to you as Christians because it says that this massively corrupt culture, we use our powerful, godly tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought. Ooh, those loose thoughts we talked about. An emotion, which we just talked about. An impulse. How many times have you written something online and you're like, I shouldn't have done that? Right? Those are impulses. Just don't do it again. Into the structure of life-shaped by yourself. Because you can do it yourself, right? Life shaped by our president? Life shaped by our governor? No. We're looking to man. And God says, life shaped by Christ. What are we doing? Church of the living God. It's time to refocus. It's time to pull our swords out and not compromise. The devil's coming after us, and we got to be battle ready. I have a story for you. There was a cross-country horse race exp- expedition. One horse suddenly shied away from the hurdle, that, and then he ran himself right into a barbed wire fence. Can you imagine that? Whew, that sounds, like, really painful. The results were disastrous. The rider was taken away to the hospital by ambulance, and the horse was bleeding all over, and he was caught up and snarled into the barbed wire fence. The underlying tragedy was seen, in fact, that the jump was a low jump. It wasn't even a high jump. It was a low jump. The horse could have totally made the jump. But instead of, when he's looking at that jump, instead of saying, I'm going to take the jump, He decided to remove himself from the obstacle and run the other way and got himself caught in the barbed wire. We as Christians do the same thing. We look at what's in front of us, the obstacle that maybe seems like too much, and we detour. And God never tells us to detour. He says, ah, I'm going to give you the strength to keep going forward and take the hard place. You're going to make it through. But we don't trust God enough. So we compromise, and we go, and we get ourselves snangled up in evil things like sin and perversion and witchcraft and rebellion. We get ourselves caught up in things that we look back and we go, how did I end up here? Just like that horse. I don't want to compromise my Christian walk and end up in barbed wire, end up snangled up in sin. Listen, I'm on this journey as much as you guys are. These are hard places. But God, but God. Peter, First Peter, I think it's First Peter, says, give all your worries and your cares to God, for he cares about you. Isn't that comforting? Oh, he cares about you. Stay alert. Stay awake. Come on, guys. Watch out for the great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Verse 9, stand firm against him. Be strong in your faith. And remember, your family of believers all over the world, we're not alone. Is God going through some kind, they are going through some kind of suffering as you are. Guys, did you know in 2019, it was the number one time for martyrs across the world. More martyrs last year than ever before. You're going, what? No. Absolutely. Satan hates us. He's looking to take us out. These aren't jokes. These are things that, no, there's no way. Listen, get out of your Christian bubble and understand that this is a real fight. There's nasty people out there, and this world is very dark, and Satan is coming after the church because he hates us, because he knows he's already been defeated. And so what he's going to do is he's going to try and take you down. Don't compromise. Don't compromise. Don't compromise. Stay alert. Read up. Know what your opponent is doing. Know where God is coming at. Number two, these men, they trusted God. They trusted God in the scariest of places. Those are hard times to trust God. I don't know. I pray that I'm strong enough to trust God in those scary places. I found myself, when you are alone, and I was facing death at one season in my life. I literally thought I was going to die. I was being abused by a boyfriend, and I thought he was going to kill me. 
I literally knew if he hit me one more time, I would probably die. I remember crying out to God in that moment, even though I felt so ashamed because I hadn't really been talking to God. I had really pulled my life away from him because I was ashamed. I was ashamed of the sin. I was ashamed of where I found myself. Do you know what happened in that moment? He gave me a way out. He told me, I need you to scream. I remember telling God, if I scream, he's going to kill me. And he showed me, I leaned my head back and I could see a crack in the door. And I remember God saying, if you scream, someone will hear you. And they're going to come and they're going to take care of you. And I remember that moment, I screamed and I don't remember anything else. All I know is I woke up in the back of this apartment, so mangled in the face that when I stood up, I couldn't recognize myself at all in the mirror. I'm blood everywhere, broken nose, everything. And I remember this woman, she screamed, let me in, let me in. I heard her scream, I'm coming in there whether you like it or not. And she barged through the door and this woman swooped me up and took me out into a safe place. And as I sat there shocked, I know that God sent her and she was on a mission and she was being used by God at that very moment to walk by at that very time to save my life at that very possible place. Listen, if he did it for me, he's going to do it for you. You've got to trust him in the scary places. Trust him in your weakest moments. Trust him when you have these places that are so dark and evil and you can hear the demons speaking and you can feel them cry out to your God and trust him because he's the rescuer and he's the savior of humanity and he loves you and he's running after you right now. He's warning us, church, because he loves us, not because he hates us, not because we're racist or we're prejudiced or any of those things. God is saying, get off that stuff. That's all man and devil. Get on me. I am the one and I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. You are called. You are chosen. You are anointed. Trust me. Trust me. I hear heaven crying this out. As I drove into work today, the only prayer I could pray was, God, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us as your church. God's heart is breaking. But God loves us. Hold on. In the den, hold on in the furnace because he's sending someone he's got your back hold on in your dark places hold on in the hopeless moments proverbs 3 5 through 6 trust in the lord with all of your heart oh, so hard to do do not depend on your own understanding seek his will in all that you do and he will show you which path to take. I think about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, these are stories we tell our kids, but we as adults need to go back and read them for ourselves. Because they weren't kids when they were going through this. They were adults. And they were facing really bad things. And God rescued them. God shut the mouths of the lions God sent an angel in, and not one part of them was scorched. They didn't even smell like fire. Have you ever started a fire outside at a campfire? You smell like campfire for like until you get to finally take a shower. It's like crazy. Can you imagine not even the smell of fire? There was no evidence of demise on God's people. God didn't allow anything to happen to them because they said, I will pray because my God says to pray. I will worship because my God says to worship. I will come to the house of God because God says, do not forsake the assembly and the brethren. I have to be with other like-minded Christians. I will greet my brother and sisters with a kiss. That's what the Bible says. God says, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. A church of the living God. Enough is enough. 
It is time to do what God says and not what this world says. Coronavirus has no cause to be moving me out of my spot in the kingdom of heaven. Either my God heals or he doesn't. And I'm telling you right now, he's a healer. And every person that I've known in this church that has gotten it has healed from it. Nobody's talking about that. But trust God. If it happens, that he's going to heal you. That he's going to touch your body. That he's going to take these things from you. Because God's the healer of disease. God's the healer of sick thoughts. God's the healer of suicidal tendencies. God's the healer of broken marriages. God is the healer of lost children. God is the healer. And he deserves to be trusted. He deserves to be praised. He deserves to have all the glory. Not some of it, but all of it. He is holy and he is just and he is merciful. And if he sent us to hell, he would still be just because he's God. Stop putting yourself in God's place. Do not mock him. Do not mock God. Do not mock him. Trust God. Do not mock him. Just, I just, so many things. So many stuff. I just keep, keep going, keep going. I've been going too long. <sighs> Number three. Do what God says. Not man. Wasn't that trusting God? No, no, no. It's one thing to know what God says. It's another thing to do what he says. I can't tell you how many Christians I talk to. Oh, I know, I know. I know, pastor. I know then why didn't you do it? Like, I'm sorry, if my kids say that to me, I'm like, you're still in trouble. You didn't do it. Like, we, for some reason, seem to think that, like, God is just this, like, either you think of him as this guy up in heaven ready to bank you over the head and kill you, I don't know, or you think of him as this, like, guy passing out lollipops and, like, it's okay, you're just so wonderful, and no, God is both. He loves us, he takes care of us, but he also spanks us and puts us back in shape. And when you don't do what he asks you to do, guess what? You reap the consequences of your sin. And that's not God's fault. That's yours. So when you do what God says to do, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when Daniel did what God told them to do, what happened? They were rescued, right? When you choose to do what God says to do, guess what happens? We're rescued. Those are, those are scary, crazy things because God might be telling you to get out of your house right now. Go buy someone some food and go make, give them lunch. God might be telling you right now to give an offering like you've never given before in faith. God might be telling you right now that to stop arguing with somebody because you're casting your pearl before swine, but you just kind of like that argument. It's kind of fun. You're feisty. It's okay. I'm feisty too. I get it. But stop casting your pearl before swine. You're wasting your time. You see, God is telling us to do some things. Number one, he's telling the church to awake today. He's telling us, understand our opponents today. He's telling us to don't compromise our life today. He's telling us to trust him today. Number three, he's telling us to do what he says. What needs to change in your lives? I want you to think about that for a second. What needs to change in your lives to begin to do what God says to do? What is he telling you to do? You're like, I don't know. I don't know if he's telling me to do anything. Well, that's not true. I just listed three things that he's telling you to do. So start with those today, okay? Start with those. Ask the Lord, where are there compromises in my life? He'll show you. Ask him where you haven't been trusting God. He'll show you. Journal it out, guys. Journal it out. And let him speak to you. Third one, do what he says. God, what are you telling me to do? He'll give you direction. He'll lead you to someone. Philippians 1, 20 through 22, for fully I am expected. <sighs> Let me go back for a second before I start this verse. You may see the opposite of what it is that you are doing. When you put your hand to something, it may not look like anything. I want to warn you about this. Because so many times I've done things for the kingdom and I've seen no result. And I'm like, I must have missed God. I think I missed God in this. And then the Lord will later, even years later, send someone to tell me what happened to them or where God 
touch them. And do you remember that message you preached? Like, or do you remember when you did this for me? And I'm like, no, I, don't, I literally don't even remember that at all. But see, God is working when you don't think he is. You just be faithful in the do. He takes care of the rest. I wanted to just say that to you. And so your life is not your own. It is bought with a price. We've been telling you that I've been saying this. We, me and the Holy Spirit have been telling you this all day. That you have been bought with a price. And that when you do something for the kingdom of God, it may be looked upon as wrong. I can't tell you how many people think I'm wrong. It's okay. I'm okay with that. Because as long as he thinks I'm right, I'm good. And when I do something dumb, I'll just apologize and I'll ask the Lord to forgive me and I will change. And I will repent. Because I'm not too prideful to do that. Some of us are very prideful in that. Like, oh, I can't, I'm not going to apologize. Just apologize and move on. Because God has things for you to do and you don't want to be left out of the kingdom plan. So here's Paul. Paul gave his whole life. And Paul says this one thing that I don't get. So here's Paul doing everything for God, right? He gave everything to God, his whole life, to the Lord. But here was a man that was shipwrecked. What? For God? Yep. Beaten? For God? Yep. Snake bitten? Yep. For God? Yep. Oh, at the end of his life, beheaded. Uh Uh-huh. That was Paul's life. But you know what? We today have this gospel Because Paul spread the word of God and he gave the word of God to the Gentiles and to the Jews. And he put the word of God faithfully and he was faithful in his due. But but Pastor Jess, you're telling me the, I don't understand, but he gave his life for it. Absolutely. Are you willing to give your life? I opened up with this question. Are you willing to give your life for the gospel. I gave you two examples of men that were rescued in their life, but I'm ending with one who gave his life for the gospel. His name was Paul, and he did the work of Christ. And Paul speaks about this in Philippians. For I fully am expected and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or I die. Other versions say, to die is gain. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. Whoo! Dying is even better. Okay, you're blowing my mind today because this kingdom stuff is so opposite of when I turn on the news and I don't hear none of this. You don't, because the world doesn't get it. They don't have eyes to see or ears to hear. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. You're going to see things differently. We're different. You're different. It's okay to be different. But get out there and do something for Christ. Quit sitting around on your butts at home. It's time to get up. Time to get out. Time to find out a way. Go to your neighbor's house. Ask if you can mow their lawn. Go do something for someone. Show someone that Jesus loves them. Do something for someone this week. Be his hands. Be his feet. Be the expression of Jesus Christ on this earth because the world is never going to give us that church. Only Christ. Luke 9, 6, 62 says, But Jesus told him, Anyone who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. We are called and we are fit for the kingdom of God. Do I have any kingdom doers in this room today? Do I have any kingdom doers online today if you're still with me and you haven't clicked me off? <laughs> I have one last story for you. Is that okay? I'm going a little longer. You guys okay with that? Long ago, in the days of sailing ships, a terrible storm arose and the ship was lost in a deserted area. Only one crewman survived and washed up on the shore of an inhabited island. In his desperation, the castaway daily prayed to God for help and deliverance from his lonely entrance and existence. Each day he looked at the passing ships and he saw nothing. Eventually he managed to build a hut into which he stored a few things that were recovered from the shipwreck. And those things helped him and made him a little bit more secure. One day, the sailor was returning from his daily search for food, and he saw a column of smoke. As he ran, he saw his hut up in flames. All was lost. Not only was he alone, but he had nothing to help him in the struggle for survival. 
stunned and nearly overcome with grief and despair. He fell into a deep depression, and he spent nearly sleepless nights wondering what was to become of him and questioned whether it's life himself, it's his life itself. The next morning when he arose early, he went down to the sea, and there, in his amazement, he saw a ship. It was lying off of the shore, and a small rowing boat was headed towards him. When he once yelled out to the ship's captain, and he asked him, how did you know to send help? And the captain said and replied, why, we saw the smoke signal you sent up yesterday. But it took us a a day to get here because the tide was drawing us away, so we had to wait. Listen, when you are in despair, hold on, girls, because your ship's captain, Jesus Christ, is coming for you. And he has got you, and he's holding you, and he's anchoring you, and you are an overcomer. You are an overcomer, and you can do this. Let's not look like the world or act like the world like Pastor Jess did yesterday, but let's be like God asked us to be today, right? Let's do what God is asking us to do. I want you to pray. I want you to fast. I want you to find out what God says and what God does. I want you to have your swords out and your shields up. I want you to be aware of your enemy around you and what he's coming after you. You get that oil. You anoint your houses. You pray over your husbands while they're sleeping. You do what you got to do, girlfriend. We might be wild, crazy, Pentecostal fanatic. I don't know, whatever. Call me whatever you want because I'm running after Jesus. And I'm not giving up. I'm not letting up. I'm not holding out. I am not falling into the sways of this world, and I am not letting my culture speak to me as if that's how it is, because my God says opposite. Today, if you sat in this room and I made you mad in the beginning, I love you. I want you to know I love you. Number two, I want you to know someone has to be able to speak what God says, and sometimes it's not easy, but I'm here to tell you, I speak these things. I study this word. I give my whole life for it so that I can come and fill you up so you can walk out those doors and be doers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because I can't win this world myself. I need all of you to be gospel carriers, full-time ministers, filled up and ready to go because you're on mission. So if you need Jesus today and you've never known him, I'm going to do this quickly. I want you to know that you cannot live your life on your own. You were bought with a price, but you have to say yes to Jesus and invite him into your heart to be the Lord and Savior of your life. What does that mean? That means that you can't do things your own way. You can't think any longer your own ways. You've got you to conform to what God says. You've got to do what God says. How do I do that, Pastor Jess? It's very simple. Jesus was talking to a man in the Bible by the name of Nicodemus, and he said, Nicodemus and Jesus were talking. Nicodemus loved God, loved the things of the Lord, understood them. But one thing he didn't understand, Jesus told Nicodemus, you've got to be born again in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus says, how do I get born again? I can't go back into my mother's womb, right? That seems like a practical question. I would probably ask the same thing. And Jesus said, no, Nicodemus, you're not getting it. What is born of flesh is flesh, but what is born of spirit is spirit. And so when you ask Jesus to come into your life and to come into your heart and be the Lord and Savior of your life, guess what happens? You become a new creation in Jesus Christ. That means all those old things, you walk away from sin. You can't fix yourself up, girlfriend. You can't do it. You won't be able to clean yourself up before you come to God. You've got to come to God the way you are and let him clean you up along the way. He loves you. He died on that cross for you. He's calling you home today. So if you're in this room or if you're online and you need to know who Jesus is, you need to pray this prayer, you need to get your life right with God. You've actually been doing a lot of the world. You've been really frustrated. You've been finding yourself angry all the time. It's because you're caught up in these demonic principalities, these things that are wasting your time and causing you foolish foolish anger for no reason. When you stay into the things of God, guess what happens? You find a peace that passes all understanding. And his name is Jesus. And he wants to come and live and dwell within you. He wants to save you. He wants to make you whole again. And so he's calling you home today. This is your day to get right with God. If you've been playing games with him, it's time to get right. You need to know Jesus Christ today. You've heard all the other religions. I gave an example of what some of the religions do to other people. That's not God. People call things God, but they're not God. God loves. God takes care of. God protects. God anoints. And he restores. And he heals. And he's calling you home today. So, on the count of three, this is what I want to do. I want to ask you 
if you want Jesus in your heart and in your life. And you're going to say, yes, I do. And how will I know? You know, Jesus is talking and he's saying, he's saying that how will I know who you are if you don't confess me before men? I can't tell my Father in heaven who you are unless you confess before men that you trust in me and believe in me. So, I just want to ask of you, every head bow, every eye closed. If you're online, I'm talking to you too. When I say one, two, three, and I do that, I want you to raise your hand if you want to get right with God, if you want to ask Jesus for the first time to come into your heart and be the Lord and Savior of your life. Get ready. On the count of three, one, two, three. Raise your hand if you want to get right with the Lord. I see that hand. I see that hand. Beautiful lady. Beautiful. Amen. Anyone else? Anyone else? Online, I'm sure there are beautiful women. I see that hand. I see that hand. Beautiful. Online, girls, I know that you're raising your hand. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray a prayer, okay? Simple prayer. It's not about the words of our mouth. It's about our heart because God is after our heart. Isn't that kind of cool? He's not after, he's not like this robot God, but he actually wants a relationship with us. And so we're going to pray this prayer. We're going to ask him to come into our heart. And then afterwards, you will be a Christian, a new creature in Christ Jesus. You will have a new purpose and a new destiny. And anger doesn't have to guide us anymore. And it doesn't have to take us out. But guess what? God will come in and rescue us and cause us to love and see things through his eyes, not through my flesh eyes, but through his eyes. All right, everybody bow your head and close your eyes and repeat after me. Dear Father God, I love you today and I come before you and I ask that you would forgive me of my sins, that you would wash me, that you would cleanse me. I ask that you would come into my heart and be the Lord and Savior of my life. Holy Spirit, fill me And as I go into your word, teach me, show me, give me new perspective. Help me to see through your eyes. Today is the day that I choose heaven and not hell. Today is the day that I leave my sin behind and I walk towards Jesus, with Jesus, hand in hand. Thank you, Father God for loving me. Amen and amen. (laughs) Woohoo! Freedom! Isn't that exciting? Your past is gone. Your sin is, you are new in heaven, new creation. I want to tell you, number one, did you know that the Bible says that when one person comes to the Lord, that all of heaven has a party? So guess what's happening right now? Heaven is rocking out on your behalf. I love that. I love that. And so don't do life alone. We here at this church, we give away friends. We give away what is called a spiritual personal trainer. And so don't do life alone. What do you do now that you're Christian? Where do I go now? Who do I talk to? How do I do this thing called Christianity? Don't worry about it. We got you. All right. And so I want you to connect in the back, right in the back as you walk out. We have somebody called a spiritual personal trainer. Just let them know. Hey, I raised my hand today. I'd like to get that book that you have for me and they can sign you up and they'll meet with you. They can do Zoom calls, phone calls, whatever, whatever you're comfortable with. They can meet in person before church service, a half an hour before church service. And then we also, if you're online, we will send you that book. And we want to know if you prayed that prayer with us. So please go to www.rockchurch.com and say, get to know God. Push the get to know God button and we will connect with you. I love you girls. Do you, are you ready? Are your swords out? Are your shields up? Are you understanding what's happening out there? It's pretty evil. It's pretty dark. Let's not be a part of it. All right. Let's be the kingdom of God. Can we do that? All right. Let's stand up. I want to pronounce a blessing over you pronounce a blessing over my beautiful girls. Bring someone to PM next week, Friday night. Woo, woo, it's outside. So if you have people that are like scared to be around other people, just say they'll be outside and we can kind of separate a little, okay? We're doing that so that maybe people feel more comfortable. All right, Lord, I ask a special anointing over these girls, a special favor to fall upon them this week, God. 
Lord, I pray that as they come and as they go, that your blessing would be upon them. Lord, I pray that you would give them new eyes to see what you want us to see, God, as your women. Lord, I pray that you give us ears to hear, God, what it is you need us to hear, Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray, God, that we will die to our flesh this week, God, and we step into our spirit. And Lord, we pray that you would lead us, Holy Spirit, that you would guide us, that you would protect us, that you would show us. Lord, I pray, God, that if they need jobs, God, give them jobs and better jobs, Lord. Provide for their finances, Holy Spirit. I pray that their kids are called back home and that they will not go to the wayside, but Lord, they will serve you all the days of their life. And Lord, I pray for marriages to be healed right now and restored, and that the love of God would bind what no man can separate, God. And Lord, we thank you for healing in those very impossible places, Lord. Lord, I thank you for a blessing to be upon each woman in this room. I love them, Lord. Bless them, anoint them, give them the wisdom that they need, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen. I love you, girls. Go give them heaven. Pray and fast. Let's, let's usher the kingdom of heaven in.